Okay, we're picking picking up where we left off. We've gotten through page 20. Um, and the judge has has really latched on to what Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe said when uh, when she got on a roll and was basically uh, admonishing the judge and and said that she doesn't even have the right to ask her or the authority to ask her to waive her rights and and the court has misunderstood all of that and is not allowing her to act as her own attorney <clears throat> so she must proceed and she's citing the Feretta case <clears throat> Miss Walters has given you the Jenks material the witness is ready to testify and we will proceed the, course, the court will also note that in the context of an identity hearing, the court cannot envision any prejudice to Ms. Tucci Giraffe by proceeding in this fashion. <clears throat> Mr. Bowes, Your Honor, I guess our concern would be that she has an absolute constitutional right to represent herself, and if she has inadvertently caused the court to have some concerns about that constitutional right, she should be allowed to clarify that. I don't know what her answer would be, whether or not, given what the court has just said, she wants to withdraw her... He gets interrupted. I must be bound by the last thing Ms. Tucci Giraffe said, which is, quote, I do not waive any rights, end quote. So you may have a seat and we will proceed. Very well, Your Honor. You may call your first witness. Ms. Walters says, Your Honor, may the government just have a brief minute to provide some Giglio information to Mr. Bose as well. So, uh, Giglio. Giglio v. United States. That's a Supreme Court case in which the court held that the prosecution's failure to inform the jury that a witness had been promised not to be prosecuted in exchange for his testimony was a failure to fulfill the duty to present all material evidence to the jury and constituted a violation of due process requiring a new trial. This is, even, this is the case even if the failure to disclose the matter was a matter of negligence and not intent. The case extends the court's holding in Brady v. Maryland requiring such agreements to be disclosed to the defense counsel. As a result of this case, the term Giglio material is sometimes used to refer to any information pertaining to deals that witnesses in, crim in a criminal case may have entered into with the government. And and, and I'm not quite sure on how this Giglio information, uh, she's giving this, before she's calling her first witness, she's giving him Mr. Bo's Giglio information. And we can see that the Giglio information has to do with a deal that uh, the witness has been promised not to be prosecuted in exchange for his testimony. So, I'm really, I'm confused here because what we're going to see in a little bit is that she calls the FBI agent. Now, why, why would Parker still have any Giglio information around him? I don't know. Um, when I was active duty law enforcement and testifying in court, uh, nobody ever made a deal with me uh, to testify uh, on a case that I was not involved in except for investigating it. There's, I never, I was never even offered a deal uh, to testify about the investigation I did uh, with the deal that they weren't going to prosecute me after the fact. Uh, that, I don't understand why this is in here at this point in the hearing um, and why Ms. Walters feels that it's pertinent that the government give Giglio information right now when the court has said you may call your witness. So, 
This is really interesting, and I'm not quite sure what this means in the bigger picture. Anyways, the court agrees, yes, of course. Your Honor, we are making a standing objection to my appointment, says Mr. Bowes. Very well. Your Honor, Miss Tucci has informed me that she does not want me representing her, so, f so filing or not filing, I'm moving to withdraw as counsel for Miss Tucci. Mr. Bowes, is it your understanding that other counsel is entering an appearance? Your Honor, I'm not aware of any other counsel that would be entering their appearance, so therefore I would ask the court to appoint new counsel for Miss Tucci. Very well, we will take a brief recess. Miss Tucci Giraffe, please return with the marshal. Actually, you may take your seats while the court takes another matter. And there's a recess taken. When they come back from recess, the judge, Deborah, says, Mr. Bowes, in accordance with local rule 44.4 .4, subsection D, the court will deny the motion finding that the motion would unduly delay the proceedings and otherwise not be in interest of justice. Now, Ms. Walters, you may call your witness. You know, I am down the Dermatria rabbit hole and rule 44.4 .4, subsection D, where A is one, B is two, C is three, D is four, there's an awful lot of fours right here in line 18. It's rule 44.4 .4, subsection four. And, and when you get into 44 in Gematria, it is, uh, it's about termination, death, killing. Um, and, and so if you're, if you have not come by Gematria, uh, there is plenty of verifiable observations to look into. I'm just noting that, wow, there's a lot of fours right here in this line. And that's the reason given, uh, of why Mr. Bose's motion to withdraw as counsel has been denied. Now, Ms. Walters, you may call your first witness. And Mr. Bose says, Your Honor, may I just be heard on that briefly? Mr. Bose, I believe I have little alternative other than to permit you to be heard. But the court has already articulated the reasons. Perhaps I should indicate that I am incorporating other reasons already set forth on the record as the basis of my determination that granting your request would be unfairly, I apologize, would not be in the interest of justice and would duly delay the proceedings. Oh, Your Honor, it's my understanding that Ms. Tucci is not seeking a delay in the proceedings, and during the intervening break, I had a chance to speak with Ms. Tucci, and she explained to me that she was unclear of the court's question, and if she were asked again today, or right now, if she is willing to waive her right to counsel with the understanding that the court received a notice of filing, she is willing to waive her right to counsel. Well, we're going to proceed, Mr. Bose, because the indication that we now have that within the space of a matter of minutes, there has been two changes of contention on that issue raises an issue of the extent to which the court can make, a Feretta, make the Feretta findings. In other words, to be specific, your proffer was that Miss Tucci Giraffe's request was to waive her right to counsel. Miss Tucci Giraffe stated when I first inquired of her at the end of her narrative that she did not waive any rights at all, including her right to be here, to have me proceed with the identity hearing or her continued detention, to name a few. The next matter was that, was that you then moved to withdraw. Now it appears that there is a request to waive counsel. This all undermines the finding that the court must make consistent with Ferretta that Perhaps I should say with respect to Ms. Tucci Giraffe's understanding of what we are doing here and the issue regarding, for example, voluntariness. I know of no prejudice which would arise to Ms. Tucci Giraffe from denying both your motion for leave to withdraw and from not undertaking any further inquiry consistent with Ferretta. And I believe that is clear based upon all that the court has found thus far including the nature of this proceeding and the further delay which would be occasioned by granting your motion. 
undertaking a further inquiry or doing anything other than proceeding. Your Honor, the record reflects that the court has already expressed a concern that the hearing should have been conducted on no later than the third day, which was Monday. Counsel for the government was ready to proceed on Monday. The court was prepared to proceed on Monday. It was with great reluctance that the court granted the request to continue the matter until today. We are all ready to proceed at this time. The witness is here. The Jenks material has been provided. The Giglio material has been provided. The exhibits have been provided and we must proceed. Your Honor, the question is not whether or not we proceed today. The question is whether or not Ms. Tucci can exercise her constitutional right to represent herself in this matter. This is exactly what happened in Ferretta, where the court, over the defendant's objection, required the defendant to accept the court-appointed counsel. Was Ferretta a trial, Mr. Bowes? It was a trial, Your Honor. Very well. This is an identity hearing. Any issues regarding Ms. Tucci Giraffe's representation of herself with regard to the merits, should the court make a finding that would lead to a commitment to the requesting district, can be addressed by the requesting district. As you have noted, this is not a trial. The court reads Ferretta to stand for the proposition that there is an entirely, there is a heightened concern regarding that issue with respect to a trial. And as I indicated, for reasons including Ms. Tucci Giraffe's response to the court's inquiry, the court must now question whether the finding the court made the finding at the time. I'm speaking of the events that have transpired since then. The court must take those issues into account in determining whether any statement at this time that she waives her rights is one as to which the court could make the requisite finding. So we must go forward. Your objection is noted. Ms. Tucci Giraffe's objection is noted. Your Honor, our position further is that a defendant at any time can elect to proceed to represent themselves. That may be the case. That does not mean that the court can make the finding, that the court can ignore all of what has occurred in the courtroom and make a finding regarding an individual's understanding of the proceeding, which to some extent the court must now question in view of what has happened since I have heard, since I heard from Ms. Tucci Giraffe. So we must proceed. For the record, Your Honor, we would ask the court to take five minutes to do an inquiry of Ms. Tucci Giraffe since she decided to change her position that she stated about 45 minutes ago and whether or not she would like to proceed. The court cannot do so. Very well, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Walters, you may call your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. At this point, the government would seek to admit and publish to the court a certified copy of the indictment in this matter and also a copy of the arrest warrant as Government Exhibits 1. Actually, as jointly Government Exhibit 1 for the purpose of the identity hearing, and these documents have been provided to Mr. Bowes. Objection, Your Honor. On what grounds? All the grounds previously... On what grounds? All of the grounds previously noted? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. The exhibits... May I ask you to hand the court's copy to the deputy clerk, please? Yes, Your Honor. And at this time, Your Honor, the government calls Special Agent Parker Steele to the stand. For the record, Government Exhibit 1 and Government Exhibit 2 will be admitted over objection. The court notes that the exhibits are identical to the ones except that they bear the exhibit sticker and the certification seal that are filed in the record. <clears throat> Uh, just for the record, Your Honor, they are jointly Government Exhibit 1. I apologize. Thank you, Your Honor. Government's Exhibit 1, number... Government's Exhibit Number 1 admitted into evidence. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Bowes, I'm making a standing objection to the introduction of any evidence in connection with... The court is aware that there is a standing objection. I believe that was... That should be clear for the record. Very well. Thank you. And then we have a row of stars, and in all caps letters, we got, uh, with spaces in between, P-A-R-K-E-R-S-T-E-I-L-L. -L. Having been called as a witness on behalf of the government, and having been first duly sworn by the deputy clerk, was examined and testified as follows. Direct examination. So here, 
they're just paraphrasing the interaction between Parker Steele and the deputy clerk. And I want to make special notice here to the way they're spelling his name here. S-T-E-I-L-L. -L. So <clears throat> let's go a little forward here. Direct examination by Ms. Walters. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Parker Steele. First name, P-A-R-K-E-R. -E Last name, S-T-E-I-L-L. -L. This line here is very, very important. Now, I am, um, I was able to highlight, oh, that was something different yesterday. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to highlight it. Um, let me find... Bear with me a second. <clears throat> I'm going to pull up the, the grand jury testimony that Parker Steele... gave back on, it was in July, I can't remember exactly what date it was. Okay, here we go. All right, so just excuse that little delay there. <clears throat> so I'll put this link down below. I downloaded this transcript from the i-uv website as well. Uh, this is testimony of Parker Still. Look, his name is spelled differently. I don't, how do we do this here? This over here. Uh, we'll blow this up. All right. See here it says S T I L L. Here it's S T E I L. Now this grand jury was impaneled February 2017 and convened in the Eastern District of Tennessee meeting in the grand jury room of the Howard H. Baker Jr. Federal Courthouse, 800 Market Street in Knoxville, Tennessee. Testimony from July 18th, 2017. And this is the date that uh, the indictment was sealed. This is the same day. The examination was conducted by Cynthia Davidson, the assistant U.S. Uh, attorney. Parker Still, a witness of lawful age, having sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, was examined and testified as follows. Examination by Ms. Davidson. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? My name is Parker Still, last name S-T-I-L-L. -L. What the fuck is going on here, guys? S-T-E-I-L-L -L on August 4th. Less than a month before then, just what? Three weeks or so? Two, three weeks? He's spelling it without an E. This is on the stand. This is under oath. Anybody who has been a law enforcement officer under oath will never misspell their name in front of the court. And even if they happen to misspeak or trip over their tongue, they are going to correct it right away. Anybody who has had any experience in law enforcement with the endless mountains of paperwork the endless times that you have to print your name out, put your name on all these reports, sign every fucking page. Are you kidding me that an FBI agent is going to misspell his name this way? 
What a material error. I have no way to explain this from my experience. This makes me think that something's going on. Now let's just take a look at his experience. We'll go back to Heather's case. And where are you employed? Currently employed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Knoxville Division. And how long have you been employed with the FBI Knoxville office? Approximately five years. And what, if any, specializations do you have? Currently worked and have worked since I started in Knoxville on the White Collar Crime Squad. And where were you employed before your employment with the FBI in Knoxville? Yes, ma'am. Before the FBI in Knoxville, I was a practicing attorney for approximately seven and a half years. During that time, I did both prosecution and defense work. Also served as a short time as a pro tem municipal court judge, as well as I have a, I'm a graduate of the JAG school. Served overseas in Afghanistan as part of Operation Enduring Freedom as Chief Legal Assistant in Kandahar Airfield. Did there come a time when you investigated a wire fraud and money laundering conspiracy that occurred during the early part of July 2017 in the state of Tennessee? Yes, ma'am, I did. Can you explain to us what your role was in that investigation? Yes, ma'am, I'm happy to. So we received information from USAA about a fraud that had occurred, and my role in that investigation was one of the investigators who looked into it and did interviews, and we ultimately made an arrest of Randall K. Bean, a co-defendant in this matter. Now I'm going to stop right there. We're going to flip over to this other one. Now this is the grand jury testimony. Now let's let's just read this for comparison and what do you do I'm a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation I'm assigned currently assigned to the Knoxville division and how long have you done that approximately five years and what type of experience did you have prior to being with the FBI prior to joining the FBI I was an attorney for approximately seven and a half years still licensed to practice law during my time as an attorney, I did both prosecution and I've done criminal defense work. Also a graduate of Army JAG School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Interesting, there's so much stuff around Charlottesville. Uh -huh. And do you have a specialization at the FBI? Are you in a squad? Do you investigate a specific type of cases? Yes, ma'am. I handle primarily white collar cases including, you know, bank fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, general financial crimes. Of course we're a small division. We all kind of have to help, you know, out on other cases. So I do stuff with the violent crime squad as well. But primarily I'd say 90% of my work is dedicated to white collar crime. And so in your role with the FBI, did you have an occasion to investigate a scheme to defraud USAA? Oh, yes, ma'am, I did. And what is USAA? Okay, USAA is a, what I'll, I'll call it a kind of multi-facet multi financial institution. It's the banking part of USAA is federally backed by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, commonly referred to as FDIC. They offer products such as insurance. I'm sure some of y'all have probably seen the USAA commercials on TV. They're also involved in real estate and retirement arenas as well. That's just some of what USAA does. And I don't think I said what it was. You, it's United States Automobile Association. And that's, so when I refer to USAA, that's what I'm referring to it as today. And again, headquartered or based out of Texas. And so tell me about your investigation. How did you, how did this come to your attention and what did you learn? Well, first let me back up just one second there, Miss Davidson. So just kind of, you know, how investigations come to the FBI. 
we rely a lot and it's something that people don't realize on citizens just contacting us with various financial fraud matters that they might be suspected of. Can this guy talk in complete sentences? This guy does not feel in his testimony to me like he's been with the FBI five years and before that he was a prosecuting attorney, a criminal defense attorney, and went to JAG school. This does not read like that at all to me. There's something out of place with this. We also rely heavily on financial institutions, banking officials, those types of individuals to reach out to us and provide us information which is ultimately what happened here, that the Director for Financial Crimes for USAA reached out to us about this situation with Mr. Randall Keith Bean, the Director, uh, the director for Financial Crimes for USAA. Huh. Well, that's what... Tom Shaw USAA was all about in a previous video. We're going to go right here to that LinkedIn file. And we see down here he was Vice President, Enterprise Financial Crimes Management. Uh, and he's, he's been there, that the VP position, uh, from 2006 to July 2017. So, when Parker Steele, Still or Steele, this one's Parker Steele, says the Director of Financial Crimes for USAA, uh, I really think that he means Tom Shaw, although he doesn't say that specifically. He just says the director, and and I'm very I'm very curious because this is this is hearsay right now uh, because we don't know who it is. He just says the director reached out about some fraud, and he doesn't even identify him. So strange. And so once you, what did you learn from this transaction with him? Sure. Or this communication with him? Yes, ma'am. From this communication, it continued in repeated communications with USAA. I have learned that beginning on or about July 5th, 2017 and continuing through July 11th, 2017, Mr. Bean embarked in a scheme to defraud USAA. So I'm just going to, well, actually this one, this is just all images. I was going to search it, but it hasn't been OCR'd yet. I'll, I'm going to have to do that, and then we'll be able to do some uh, Control-F searches. Uh, let me switch back over to the DC court transcript. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to get through page 30 here. <clears throat> So the way he testifies about this uh, in Washington, D.C. is slightly different. Did there come a time when you investigated a wire fraud or money laundering conspiracy that occurred during the early part of July, 20, of July 2017 in the state of Tennessee? Yes, ma'am, I did. Can you explain to us what your role was in that investigation? Yes, ma'am, I'm happy to. So we received information from USAA about a fraud that had occurred, and my role in that investigation was one of the investigators who looked into it and did interviews, and we ultimately made an arrest of Randall K. Bean, a co-defendant in this matter. And so you developed suspects in that particular matter? Yes, ma'am, we did. And can you tell us specifically who were developed as suspects in that particular matter? Yes, ma'am, we initially developed Mr. Randall Bean as a suspect in the matter, 
Later, we also develop Miss Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe as a subject in the matter. <clears throat> now, suspect is totally different from subject. Now, you've got suspects, you've got victims, you've got witnesses, and you've got subjects. Now, a suspect <clears throat> is somebody who you suspect of perpetrating the crime. A subject is somebody who I think might be related to the crime, but I'm not sure how yet. A victim is the person who suffered the damages arising from the crime. And a witness is someone who, for most, for most of this uh, crime, was an unrelated party other than that they somehow witnessed saw, heard, smelled, felt the crime go down. So you've got suspects, witnesses, witnesses, and subjects. Subjects means that they don't know how they're related. And then immediately the defense attorney and can you tell us specifically how you developed Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe as a suspect in that matter? So immediately we have the defense attorney changing the word, redefining Heather from a subject, <clears throat> someone who may be related to this case but they don't know how, into a suspect. This is fucked up. These are legal terms and everyone who is present here should know all about those. So this is the end of page 30 and and I that's where I plan to get through uh, for today. There are inconsistencies out the ass especially with how Parker Still is spelling his name just a mere few weeks apart from each other. It's either S-T-I-L-L -L or it's S-T-E-I-L-L. -L. And I am really puzzled as to how that happens. I cannot reconcile that from any of my prior law enforcement experience and I want to make that perfectly clear to everybody that there is funny business, monkey business going on with this case. And here's the observations that document that. In black and white, now out on the internet for the entire world to see.